Today, we are in Jeremiah chapter 29. Um, it is a very exciting passage because, um, l- let's just be honest, I'm going to read a verse. Raise your hand if you know this verse or have heard it. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Who's heard this verse? Who knows this verse? Anyone heard it? Okay. Who owns, now don't lie, don't lie, who owns this verse on a coffee cup, bumper sticker, corny t-shirt, or something like that? Yeah, there you go. There you go. I love this verse because um, it comes in a chapter that I adore, but I think we often pull out of its context, and we kind of just take this verse as a banner without looking at what comes right before it. And in this sermon series called Savvy Faith, where we're learning what it's going to take to share our faith in a a practical, tangible, intelligent, reasonable way that shares God's love with others, this chapter um, always is one of the top two that come into my mind. So we're going to pray, and then we're going to be in Jeremiah 29, verse 4 to 7. Father, you are good. Lord, you have raised up in this chapel family so many incredible people with incredible gifts. And Lord, today we're beginning and we have begun, Lord, in the back, pouring into the next generation, pouring into these children who are going to uh, be the Sunday school teachers, the pastors, the business leaders in the faith community, the artists of the next generation who will shape my grandkids. So Lord, I, I want us to lift them up. And today as we talk about how to build a city that is based on your principles, based on your word, I pray that you would ignite a movement. And this can only be done by your power, God, so I ask in the name of Jesus that you would do it. In Jesus' name, all God's kids said, amen. Amen. Um, I want to know the the plans God has for me, and and most of you want to know the plans God has for you. However, the, one of the best-selling nonfiction books in the history of the world um, starts with the phrase, it's not about you. So I know that somewhere in the human condition, we understand that, that there's something bigger than just us, our path, our purpose. Now, it is imper- important to know that we have a path, that God has a plan, because on uh, weeks like this past week, it, it hasn't felt like God, either, either God's not good, or maybe God doesn't have a plan, or maybe it's a bad plan. But this passage today, I think, speaks to us. And this was picked long before the tragedies of Parkland, Florida. So we're going to read uh, through our section of Scripture, Jeremiah 29, starting in verse 4 through verse 7. If you don't have a Bible or an app, it'll be on the screen behind me. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses, live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons. Give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there. Do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, in the welfare of the city, you will find your welfare. May God bless the reading of his word. So if you're, if you're not familiar with the story of God, there's, there's some arcs that happen. And this is in one of the main arcs of the biblical story where God's people had messed up and God sent them through the hand of the Babylonian empire into exile. So literally someone came in, took the Jewish people and sent them in different parts all over the Babylonian empire. They wanted to separate them so that they could not come together and form a revolt. This was a very common way that the uh, Babylonians would would take over. They wouldn't just wipe everyone out. They would say, we're going to take 10% of you, put you here, 10% of you a thousand miles this direction. But what it was at the core was taking a people who had a home, who had an identity and had a culture, and putting them in the middle of a hostile culture, putting them in the middle of cities that were not their own amongst a people who did not necessarily like them. Now, this is, um, this is something that I think has been happening in our day and age, but it's a little bit different for us because many of us are not moving. However, the world is moving around us. And I could not tell you in light of what has happened in the, in the recent shootings, um, I could not tell you how many times I've heard, you know, this was not the country that I grew up in. And it's true. It's not the country that you grew up in because it's not that time. And there are differences that are good now and differences that are bad now. There are uh, areas where evil has 
rained and flooded into our culture, but there are areas where God's grace has held back the tide of darkness. For us, it's not that we, as followers of Jesus, are being exiled somewhere else. It's that we, if we continually stand on this book as the eternal truths of God, the world will shift around us, and it's shifting faster and faster by the day. If we stand on God's principles, and you stand fast for two years, you will not have changed, but the world around you will have drastically. I can remember this shift that has occurred. And now, I mean, if you want to be seen as odd or antiquated or believing in some ancient um, irrelevant book, just tell people you're a follower of Jesus. In this community, in this culture, where tolerance is, is said to be the most amazing thing and we all need to be very tolerant, I find it very disturbing how untolerated I can be in public sectors simply for believing in something for which I have not changed my views on in 20 years. We are becoming more and more exiles in a foreign land. Some of you don't even recognize this country from what you grew up in. But I want to tell you today that God, God's plan is bigger than your plan and my plan. This was God's people being taken into a hostile culture. In our day and age, hostility is coming around the Christian faith in many different avenues and by many different means. But God says this, before he gets to Jeremiah 29, 11, before there's a plan for you, before there is good for you and not evil, before you have a future and you have a hope, God tells you, build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. This is very practical stuff. Uh, I've, I love Florida, you guys. Florida's my favorite place that I've lived. I've lived in Southern California, Hawaii, and Florida. I've I've suffered in Jesus' name, and I'm here suffering with this amazing uh, weather. Although, fair warning, I found a love bug outside before service today. So for all you Floridians, I know the fear I just set upon your hearts. Okay, but anyway, um, the building of houses is good. And nowhere in my life have I seen building go on like it's going on in Florida. It's it's insane to me. I, when we bought our house, um, I circled on Google, Google Maps, here's the chapel. My wife circled, like, here's my favorite stores, like Costco and stuff like that. So we drew a circle in the middle and gave it to the real estate agent. So I have to drive in to Fishhawk, and I can choose one of two ways. They're almost the identical amount of time. One way is just suburban, driving through Pleasantville, right along Fishhawk Boulevard. The other way is the back way, where for a city kid, there's, there's cows, you guys, like legit numbers of cows. I've seen deer. I've seen rats with armor. You guys call them armadillos or something like that. Um, It's it's country out there, but more and more, it's disappearing. I mean, more and more, there's these uh, lords of the underworld. I think their names are Lennar and Beezer or somebody, and they're just taking over all around here. My fear, though, is that we're building these houses, but we're actually not building community. We're building up these houses where we never or rarely inhabit our front porch and we often sit in our back one eyes. We're building these houses, but we're not actually living with neighbors. We're we're making gardens with food, but we don't share meals. God wants to be explicit to his people. In the midst of exile, in the midst of when you feel like everything is against you, nothing is going right, I want you to plant down roots. I want you to be a part of something, not just live there and wave like the Truman Show. I want you to put down roots and engage. I want you to build a house because in that day, building a house meant I'm here. I'm gluing myself to this place for better or for worse, to love and to pour out. And and now we often view cities and communities as a resource for us rather than viewing ourselves as an integral part of the lifeblood of a community. And it doesn't mean you have to live in in this community, but I mean in our area, in our region, Fishhawk, Hillsborough County, Tampa. Are you rooted here? Are you committed? And I understand there are military families here. That is one of the most difficult uh, phases of life to go through, I think, when you have to uproot, move, replant, uproot, move, replant. Or maybe some of you do that for vocation. For those of you who are doing that in that rhythm, I would pray that every time you uproot, I mean, you've got to think of it like plant growth. You've got to pour vitamins in the soil so that when you plant back in, you can say to your community, I'm here for three years. I'm all in, 100% in. Just know that I'm going to go, but that doesn't mean that I care any less than if I were staying forever. 
I don't know if this is going to be true, but my prayer was the very first church that I became the lead pastor at would be my very last church. Because I've seen pastors that just pull up when things get difficult and go to another church and then another church and another church, or they want to go to the next opportunity, this or that. But I've always wanted to just say, I'm going to give my life for a city. And when I was looking at different churches, I mean, I, I was weighing heavily. I was, Tampa seemed like an okay city to give my life to. If God called me to like, I don't know, Kansas City or something, I would have gone, but I'd just weep every Sunday and I'd have the most miserable sermons because I need ocean. I hope God is not, never mind. Okay, <laughs> every time you say stuff like that, God's like, <laughs> no, he's not like that. He's got a good plan. But, but are we building houses? Are we planting gardens? And, and the equivalent to that, are we having people over? Like, don't think that because I read this and on the surface, like, oh, yes, I had my house built in this community. And don't think because it says gardens that your little sad excuse of basil and cherry tomatoes, I'm not talking about that. This verse is talking about being somewhere and eating with people, building into people's lives so that people can come over and be part of your life. It's amazing to me that even though we have this amazing community and all of these communities around us, how isolated we can be and how much we can still hide behind our two layers of drywall or concrete block. It's amazing to me that I have to have weird rules as a pastor now. So for example, um, if you're under 40, I rarely will ever just call you out of the blue. I will text you first and say, do you have time for a call? Because if you're under 40 and I just call you without texting first, it's almost like you feel like someone's abusing you. Like, why would they waste my time of me looking at my phone that's a phone? And then they swipe, ignore call with message. Sorry, can't talk right now. If you think that's weird, I mean, literally 20 years ago, I could uh, go with all this stuff going on nowadays. Isn't that weird? Like, we all looked. Four people got their gun out of their holster because someone was coming up on stage. Be careful, Jeff. Man, this is serious. It's, it's amazing how 20 years ago I could knock on someone's door, but now you text, hey, can I come over? And what happens now if someone knocks on your door? You open it, you do a crack, like it's, this is probably Jeffrey Dahmer at my door. I'm just going to peek out. We've built these houses. We have this facade of community, but we don't have community. God tells the people that are in a hostile environment, Build houses, get married, have children. Some of you are thinking in verse, you know, verse six. I'm not the kid type, uh, I'm, or I'm past having kids, or I'm married, but we don't want kids. We're going to travel. This verse is about much, much more than just having children. It's about not letting fear freeze your forward progress. Because it's natural for us when we have a fear. There's a biological reaction to hide, to clam up, to retreat. But God says, don't do that. You're in a hostile environment. You've been ripped from your land. I want you to move forward. Don't let fear freeze you and keep you in the past. Don't let fear make it so that you're not thinking about the future generations. If anything, it should have the opposite effect. But for whatever reason, fear causes us to just clam up and not share and be more isolated. Because what if I go into community and one person in my community is broken? Or dangerous. This is the community that they lived in. I love that verse, you know, take wives, have sons and daughters, give your daughters in marriage. I don't like that part. I like some of the other parts. But it, it, it sort of gets the question stirring in my heart. What are Christians known for? What are we known for? Like if you ask someone who does not go to church, is not part of a church, if you say, hey, what is Christianity about to you? Like what do you think Christianity is about? And let's, let's change this. Let's not do the pastor listener thing. Let's do like the Tony Robbins thing. Like you can answer. Like I'm looking for a question. What do people say Christians are about? What, if someone says, what is a Christian? What do you think of Christians? What do they say? What? People who go to church. Yeah, that's, that's true. Most of the time. What, what else? What else do people say about Christians who don't know anything about churches? Yes. They believe in Jesus. Yeah, that's like bare minimum. You've got to believe in Jesus. But I'm talking about people that don't go to any church because you guys are giving me church answers uptight i don't even know what that means but i feel good about it i'm uptight yes bible thumper yes 
hypocritical. That one comes up. Hypocrite, literally, it means mask wearer. Hypocritus means you, you're wearing a mask. It's not the real you. That's what a hypocrite is. So hypocritical, Bible thumper, believes in Jesus, goes to church. Now, we are often known what we are against. We are often known for the negative side of Christianity. We get the bad rap. And if you think you get the bad rap, I mean, I'll hire you part-time as a pastor if you want, because every time they talk about some clown on the news, that's what people think I am. I say I'm a pastor, and they're instantly questioning, like, oh, you know, what do you drive? And I'm like, I drive a Jetta. Uh, the only person that envies my car are 16-year-old Newsom High female students, okay? I'm not driving an Audi. I'm not living in some $10 million mansion, nor will I ever, unless I get money far, far from here. And I, even then, I don't think I could. I just feel guilty all the time. But my question is this, because it, this... This call that God is calling us to is to plant and root in a city, to move forward, to have forward progress. And, and just because life is not going according to your plans or according to the way that your political party, whichever side you're on, is going, does not mean that it is not in God's control and part of God's plan. I read uh, so many times people, when tragedies happen, people post things. I post something, other people post things. Um, obviously, I wouldn't post things unless I thought what I was saying was the best and most brilliant, Okay. However, I need us to understand that the posting of platitudes will not get us very far in winning people toward the love of Christ. Um, saying things that don't even make sense to me, and if you posted this, I'm not picking on you, I didn't see anything, I'm not like isolating people, but there's a letter that says, you know, you kick God out of schools in and, and this time, and now you wonder, you know, why God's not there. Like saying that a legislator could kick God out of a school is like saying a red ant could defeat a flood. Okay, it's just not comparable. We can't kick God out of schools. We can say um, we don't want to talk about God in schools, but as long as there's a person walking through schools, the Spirit of God is literally walking around that campus. And even if no one's there, God's presence goes where he wants, does what he wants, because he's God. That's what God means. It doesn't mean he's like, oh, the lawmaker has passed a law. My hands are tied. It, it, when we say it out loud, it just sounds so foolish, but we have to understand that God, in the midst of this difficult situation that is far more difficult than ours, he's saying, press into the community, build houses, work for the next generation to raise up a future and a legacy. It's in times like this, though, where I think we have to be proactive instead of being reactive. The church for so long has been against this and against this. We are against abortion. We are against uh, sin uh, of different sexual sins. We are against greed. We are against all of these things we're against. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't functionally be against those things, but what are we for? Why is the church the last place that you go to learn about sex when the creator of sex runs this place? And by the way, it's not me, okay? He, he has a book that teaches us about sex that would make you blush. Now, I don't recommend just going to read it because unless you know ancient Hebrew poetry, they're not good pickup lines. Like husbands, like don't go to your woman tonight after you read the book about sex. It's called Song of Solomon. And don't be like, hey girl, your neck is like a tower of David and your teeth are like freshly shorn sheep. Your hair looks like a flock of goats coming down the mountain of Gilead. Ooh, like it won't work for you. It worked for the Hebrew people apparently because uh, the kids were born. But, um, but why, are, why isn't the church on the forefront because we've allowed in our culture what I'm calling the dehumanization of our country. We have taken uh, the, the fact that people are made in the image of God, all humans made in the image of God, all the people of the world, God sent Jesus to die for the people of the world, not just people like you, because Jesus loves you, died for you, God sent his son for you. God sent his son for the shooter at Parkland, Florida, and the shooter of the school before. God sent his son for people that I don't like as a human. I don't like racist people. God sent his son to die for them. Should that change the way that I'm engaging? Because it's, it's time that instead of being reactive, though, and saying this is everything we're against, we show the world what we are for. We show the world that we are for a sexual ethic that is wired into the human experience biologically. An article recently just came out in the New York Times um, saying that it's time to declare war on 
porn, pornography. The New York Times, because they've seen how it's dehumanizing, creating this um, ideal that women and men can be seen as simply objects for our entertainment or pleasure. And now, the New York Times is saying that some of this, psychologists now believe that is leading to the, the rape culture and this desensitivity to human life. And if you want to talk about pro-life culture and, and the difficulties that come w- with uh, the termination of pregnancies, and it's not just those things, and it's not just, it's not just the big things, it's the little things, it's the way that we ki- raise our children. Are they going around, and are they seeing things that we never saw as kids? And I'm not here to be that fuddy-duddy guy that says like, oh, you know, if your kids play Doom and listen to Marilyn Manson, they're going to be doomed forever. But I'm going to say, let's just think about this logically. If, if a kid is simulating deaths of people that look like humans for 10 years and, and we don't do anything about that, I mean, this is the dehumanization of our nation. The church needs to be on the forefront of rehumanizing, making it known that every one of these children are made in the image of God. And you may not have kids, you may be past the child age, but every one of us, the day after every shooting, has a fear in the back of our minds, whether it's grandkids or your own children or your neighbor's kids, because we understand intrinsically that there's something fragile about the life of children. When they do great things, it's great. And when danger befalls them, we grieve greatly. The dehumanization isn't just those big topics either. It's something like I was talking about with a parent on uh, End Zone Saturday yesterday. I said, hey, how'd your kid's team do? And he said, they got crushed. I said, well, yeah, that's good for him, though. And then I thought about it. You know why it's good for him? Because the, the three things that they're saying are leading to these mass atrocities, one of them is experiencing loss and not knowing how to cope with it because we're giving trophies to people in 90th place. Let's just say you lost. I'm going to teach you how to cope with loss because daddy has lost a lot. But you know what? Even though I lose and you lose at some things, at the main thing in life, the number one thing that matters, faith in God and being with him forever, we can't lose because Jesus won. The rest of it, man, you're going to get jacked up. Because we can protect our kids up until what? They're 18, 19, 20. If you're doing that other parenting thing up until they're 29, but eventually your kid's going to experience loss. Eventually they're not going to get the trophy. So we have to be proactive. We have to wage war against the pockets of hell that are all around us. 1 Peter 2.11 says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners, as people who are traveling through, as exiles, this is what the New Testament calls us, we are exiles, abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul there are desires within every person they are trying to get us to to not be about god when it says wage war against your soul just say just imagine it's waging war against the the most important commandment there's a war within you saying we're going to get you to not love god and not love others that's what it boils all the way down to so we are going to wage war against that every single sin that we do is us Not loving God or not loving others. and It's usually loving ourselves first. We have to push back against this dark cloud that is covering humanity. Not just now. It's not just now covering us. It's always been here since the fall, Genesis 3. It will be here until the end of time. But we pray the Lord's Prayer. God, your kingdom come, your ethic, your rules come down to earth as they are in heaven. This is what it means to be living the Christian life. We are... um, we're hiring somebody here soon. I'm super pumped because I'm so exhausted. Um, so we get to hire someone. And it was just going to be a youth pastor. And we've known for a couple months, the elders talk about it, like, yeah, we're going to put it out, you know, youth pastor thing. And usually those job descriptions are like, blah, 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 loves students, knows the gospel. It's like the most generic things. And I was a youth pastor for uh, a long time, so I feel bad for the first person that interviews, I, or I felt bad. But then I was praying Um, this week, and I I felt uneasy about posting, which is why I hadn't posted the job yet. I'm going to be posting it up this week on the website and Facebook and putting out feelers to my connections, but I thought, you know what? I don't, I don't want a youth pastor. Like, the youth ministry model, it's a, it's a failed experiment. It, it began in the the 40s and 50s, and we've seen youth leave the church at alarming rates and not, uh, not return often, Um, and then I thought, you know, that's, I don't want to hire somebody to just minister to our youth here. There's got to be something more. 
So as I was praying, um, I just came up, and I don't know if this is the official job title yet, but I'm going to call this person uh, the Student Community Development. Like maybe a director, I don't know what they're going to be called. But their job is not going to be corralling middle schoolers and making sure the high school team leaders are doing their curriculum job. That's going to be part of it, but that's not the main part. That's the number two part. The number one part is that I want us as a church body to fight back against the hell that is in this world. And I don't want us to do it by going out and labeling, judging, condemning. I want us to be known by what we're for. I want us to understand that we need to look ourselves in the mirror and say, am I part of God's family movement to push back the darkness in this world because this student community development position, what they're going to do is I'm going to have them raise up volunteers and teams of people from not just this church family, although we are insanely gifted here, but from as many uh, church families and faith communities as we can, and I want to create opportunities for students who are hurting, troubled, broken, who don't have mentors, maybe both parents have to work to pay all the bills, to have a regular space to come on a weekly basis or more than once a week where it's not just coming, hearing some jokes, playing a game, throwing a water bottle in a Jesus talk, but it's people like us coming together saying, hey, do we know three musicians who could teach a three-week class? We're going to have guitar classes for free. You, we'll bring guitars, you just sign your kid up, and it, it's anyone in the community. It's not just for these kids, it's for all the kids. And we're going to cast nets over at the middle schools and say, hey, guidance counselors, we have this resource available. And here, if, if you have kids that are going through a hard time, if you have kids that are experiencing loss, lost a parent, their parents have cancer, whatever it is, if they have repeat offensive uh, ac- actions, send them here. Because we have teams of trained adults who are, we're going to background check the junk out of you because I love the kids, but but... We're going to create these teams, and this person's going to oversee that. Where all we do is say, we need someone that does the arts, and we're going to teach the kids arts. We need entrepreneurs who are creating businesses for human flourishing, and we're going to have kids intern at your business for three months. We're going to have people that own restaurants and say, hey, come over to my restaurant. I'm going to show you what it's like to run a restaurant. Because right now, so many of the kids, and by kids, I mean like men under 30. That's it's terrifying that I have to extend it that far, are doing nothing but staring at screens. They're not working for anything. They're literally running on the treadmill of life when there's so much darkness in this world. We have to press in and be for something. So we're going to declare war. And we're going to do it by raising up a community. Because this passage tells us, as the city goes, so our welfare goes. The city goes good, we go good. city goes bad, we go bad. So this is what we're going to do. I'm super excited to hire someone. I have no idea who it is yet, but I'm praying. Because this isn't just the youth pastor job. This is like a grassroots, build into your community, give your life, bleed from hard work sort of job. We've got to be known what we're for. Yes, theologically, we are for God. We are for forgiveness. We are for Jesus. We are for the cross. We are for generosity and kindness and loving our neighbors well. We're for the good news of Jesus, setting people free, opening blind eyes. The only reason that we are traveling toward God's kingdom is because Jesus exiled himself so that we could be brought into the family forever. And if we don't get that first, if we don't understand that Jesus said, I'm leaving heaven to go to earth to become nothing and die so that I can bring these kids into my family. If we don't start there, we're going to start with motivations that will fizzle out because it, it is exhausting. It's exhausting, I know. I've seen, I've seen it, I've experienced it. Some of you know the feeling of coming home from work and your battery is at 0%. And your kids are thinking, Daddy just got home. Now it's our playtime. Have you ever tried to, to call someone when your battery is on 0%? It's the most frantic thing you've ever done. I, my battery's going to die. That's what we're giving our kids most days and our grandkids and our neighbors. Maybe it's because we're doing this alone. We're pulling the weight alone. Because some weeks I have no more battery in the tank. But some weeks I do. And on those weeks, maybe that's when I need to do the practical side of what it means to be for something. For foster care. For child development. For community events that provide tangible resources that show off God's hardwiring of the universe. For 
for entrepreneurs creating businesses aimed at human flourishing? Why is the church not being involved and why aren't we pressing into these things? For sharing meals with others, like actually sitting down, eating a meal with someone who you're not related to, which might be pleasant because that means there'll be people at the table that you like for some of you. Maybe it means for taking your neighbor's trash cans in, like the little things. I said that in the first service, and then I realized my neighbor was here, and I was like, dang it. I'm locked in. For helping your neighbor with yard work. For caring for your friends, the, the friends of your children when they're at your house. Feed those kids. Pray for those kids. Ask them how they're doing. Because the isolation and the loss and the humiliation that all of these atrocities have in common, these shooters have in common, they've just gone through loss. They've been humiliated, and they're, they're uh, feeling like someone else is the problem. Part of it is, is that we're not paying close enough attention anymore. Are you getting the picture, I hope? We need to nurture every form of life and fight back against the things that rob us and others of abundant life in Jesus. For our country, I, I, you know, I really don't, I don't care. It sounds bad. I don't care what America was because we can't go back. I care what America is today and what it can be. I care what the world is today and what it can be in the future. And I don't know another way, and I don't know other people that have a better way other than the radical, saving, freeing power of Jesus, but not in the expression that it's existed in for some time. You know who invented orphanages? Christians. It started because in the Roman Empire they would leave unwanted babies at the city limits, and Christians said no. You know who invented hospitals? Christians. Let's patch up those who are broken. Let's help and, and give medical care to the needy. You know who invented universities to create excellent humanity experience and education? Christians started universities. And I'm not saying that so we can pat Christians on the back. I need us to understand that the Christian faith is vastly more than pew sitting and pew hearing. It's going into the streets and bringing God's love there. And it's bringing God's love there when we can take our masks off and no longer have to thump people with Bibles. I, I know the Bible thump thing. My first Bible literally was engraved, Tyrona's Thumper. I was that guy. But God's love is bigger. And he loved a train wreck like me. And then, he, and then God hired me. And today God's hiring you. He may not pay you through the church, but don't, don't be mistaken. God's routing every one of our paychecks. If you're in the family of God, God says, you are in ministry to push back the darkness in the world, and I'm paying you through this corporation. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not evil. Plans for good to give you a future and a hope. Don't cling on to this verse if you're not going to stand on the verses before it. We must press into our city. We must press into our community. We must tell them that in Christ they can have a future and a hope that is unlike anything they've ever seen or tasted or experienced. And just so you know, my goal in this is not to get a ton of people here. We are too concerned as churches and, and pastors, church leaders, with how many seats we can get warmed up. It's just ridiculous. You warming this seat, all that means is that I've got to spend some time cleaning them with a steam cleaner later at some point. We're not going to make a bunch of money by sending people into the community, by raising up a volunteer force. It's going to be hard. We're strapped, but we're, I'm hiring somebody because this has to be done. Jesus Jesus blows me away that he could love some of the people that have done these terrible things. I don't get it, but I hope that his spirit within me will change me and make me understand more and more to bring hope where there is despair, to bring peace where there is chaos, to bring good news in a bad news world. I just don't want... Um, it's too late for my kids' generation. Uh, I'd, I'd be surprised if the tide turned before my kids are 18 and adults. 
Um, it's, it's taken about a generation to get where we are today. The, this generation is, would be unrecognized. If you, would have tell, if you told me 30 years ago that in 30 years from now, there's going to be a, a great frequency of these public shootings, school shootings, and not the good stuff. If you told me the good stuff, I wouldn't even believe the good stuff. If you told me that, if you told me 30 years ago, if you said, hey, 30 years from now, we're all going to walk around with screens that can think and talk to you and tell you all the information on the planet. I'd be like, dude, you've been sipping the Star Trek juice, brother. The world has changed. Jesus can and will one day fully remove the presence of sin from the human experience for his children. But for now, he's called us to fight. The reason I pray for Lucy, the reason I go to the back and I love the Sunday school teachers that we have is because those kids are going to be the ones that are teaching my grandkids. And we can, today, we have a legacy that's spinning its wheels, looking to politicians instead of saviors, and looking to laws instead of the spirit of the God of the universe. I mean, when you say it that way, let's call our politicians. Yes, call them. And call them until their voice box doesn't fill up. But we've been doing that. Maybe it's time we grab some handles on our own and begin the hard work of restoring a generation that is broken. And maybe it's time we take responsibility for some of the actions we've taken as parents or grandparents. Because I don't want my grandkids, and my great-grandkids, to be experiencing what many of the students are experiencing this week. I want, I want my grandkids... I want Jackson and Silas and Savannah's and Bella's kids to read about this as like a dark mark in a history book. I don't want to worry about my kids when I put them on a bus. And um, faith communities, we can't just do this weird church game. We've got, to, we've got to do more. We need to fill the streets with God's love and be present in the lives of kids and families that are broken and be open and honest enough to tell others when we're feeling broken and desperate. So that's where we are, fam. <clears throat> Let's pray. Father, um, come down and, and rule and reign. Jesus, you are the king. I pray that your kingdom would collide and crush the kingdoms of darkness that have reared their heads. Whether it's the genocide in Syria, the terrorist attacks across uh, Europe, the shootings in America. Lord, every person on this planet knows that there is a better way, but unfortunately, many people on this planet are looking and walking on the wrong path. Lord, you are the path. Jesus is the door. Help us to see. Help us to know. God, I pray that you would raise up this generation, that the gift that this generation of church community and adults can give to the young people is one of sacrifice and love and hard work and radical generosity to push back the darkness. Lord, open our eyes to see children in pain, not, so, not just so that we can report a kid, but so that we can walk alongside a kid or a family. Help us to see when neighbors are isolating themselves and, and dwelling under rage so that we can enter in and bring kindness and hope. And maybe, God, maybe it's to our own detriment, but you left heaven. You left heaven and all the, of its comforts to bring us in. So, God, help us leave our front porch to bring others. Lord, this is going to be worth it one day. It'll be worth it all to see your face, to hear your voice, to feel your embrace and to be there forever with those who you will call across our paths in the coming years. Lord, this is for you, and it's all about you, and it always will be. Make every church grow in this way, not numerically, but with a heart to carry the broken, to lift up the hurting, and to love the needy. In Jesus' name, amen.
Um, this is where I'm supposed to do the offering thing. Yes, I'm learning how to do this church thing, you guys. Um, we, I thank you for your generosity. It's only because the chapel has been going on a positive trajectory that we are able to um, begin to make these hires to change things in our community. Um, so we appreciate your generosity. If you, are, if you are new to the chapel, if this is your first time visiting, please, I, I ask that your only gift to the basket be a connection card. You can fill one out in one of the chairs in front of you. That way I can follow up, shoot you a text later, because um, that's what we do. We don't call people. I'll shoot you a text, give you a call if you wanted to talk. Um, place that in the offering basket. But just know that a as we grow as a church family, um, I'm just hiding this whole organization within the chapel umbrella um, so that we are going to be a resource to our community. We are going to rise up for our community regardless of whether or not people come here. I don't care. What I care about is that kids and adults and parents, husbands who are at their wit's end, wives who are ready to just walk out of a family, children who are ready to snap and break, my prayer is that we can resource the community irregardless of how many people attend here because God has favored us and given us a generous church family, um, and that's why we do this offering. So let me pray for it. God, I pray that we would um, maximize every gift that is given, that you would help us to see um, ways that we can uh, leverage and use all of the resources that we as a family contribute so that we can bring on uh, staff people and raise up a generation and build new things that I don't think churches have built for a long time. That we could do this for your name and for your glory and to share the good news of all you've given for us. God, this, this is all for you as an act of worship. In Jesus' name, amen.